Hello and welcome to the Lifting the Iceberg podcast. My name is Tyler James Berger, and on this episode, I sit down with Raphael Zaki. Raphael is a media theorist who earned his master's degree under the cyberpunk media theorist Douglas Rushkoff. Raphael is an expert at the intersection between social activism, digital economics, media, and the occult. On this episode, I talked to Raphael about the philosophy and practices behind the concept of magic and how these occult practices are used as a bridge into the human subconscious. Now, let's lift the iceberg with Raphael Zaki. So, magic. Magic is a word that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Images of card tricks and stage performances and David Blaine could pop up in some people's minds. Mm -hmm. Other people might think of it as an adjective to describe a moment that is imbued with significance and synchronicity. That moment was magic, you know, or to describe a day at Disney World. Um, But magic, particularly when it's spelled M-A-G-I-C-K, can also mean something completely different. So my first question to lay the foundation for the conversation we're about to have, what does magic mean, particularly when you spell it with a K? Yeah, well, I think it's a great umbrella catch-all term for um, a host of parapsychological, um, mental and emotional modalities of human experience. The term magic with a K goes back to Aleister Crowley. Mm -hmm. He used the K to distinguish what he was doing and what he was kind of a proponent of um, from stage magicians. And I I like his definition of magic. He calls it the art and science of causing change to occur Mm -hmm. in conformity with will. Mm Mm-hmm. And Jason Louvre, who's also a kind of a uh, very pop, um, uh, magical podcaster, writer, he's recently written a book called John D and the Empire of Angels, which really, I think, clears up a lot of the confusion around what magic is, where it comes from, is it real, is it something we should believe in, and what has it turned into, you know, what is it, its latest iteration in the 21st century? Mm. And he kind of talks about the difference between stage magicians who essentially use your perceptual limitations mm-hmm. to produce a magical effect, typically to, to create illusion, to create an illusion. Um, whereas a ceremonial magician is about stripping away illusion, mm-hmm. right? So it's actually getting at the mm-hmm. core of the sense perception making modality of the human organism and steering it in the direction of your will. And that might sound really kind of high, you know, very abstract, but really I think at the core of, um, I think at the core of mysticism, at the core of um, meditation, psychedelic exploration, Mm -hmm. peering into the subconscious, I believe what led me to magic as as essentially as a system for exploration into the subconscious is that that's really what's on the other side. What's mm. on the other side is the meta programmer. Um, Robert Anton Wilson uh, alludes to uh, Arthur C. Clarke's um, quote about technology: "Any mm-hmm. sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic." From magic. And yeah. he, you know, he kind of elaborated on it to to say that any form of parapsychology can be. Uh, any sufficiently advanced form of parapsychology is indistinguishable from mm-hmm. magic. So Robert Anton Wilson wrote a great book called The, Cos- the Cosmic Trigger, which I would urge anyone listening to this to check out. Uh, that's an amazing book and a, r- a really great introduction to this idea of uh, reality being uh, plural and malleable and mutable yeah. and this idea of having a reality tunnel. Um, but, you know, with magic... Uh, Aleister Crowley really laid the groundwork uh, when he gave the functional definition, the science and art. Magic is the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will, yeah. you know, and and this idea has been uh, kind of spun off 
uh, into different forms of pop enlightenment, such mm-hmm. as the secret right. or new age um, philosophy peddled by celebrities of mindfulness, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but it seems that in order to use these techniques, it requires one to not attribute objective reality to anything. You said that magic is stage magic is creating an illusion and ceremonial magic is stripping it away. Mm. But I don't know if I necessarily understand it like that because magic, uh, from what I've read in Aleister Crowley's work and and also Robert Anton Wilson's work, um, magic seems to suggest that all of reality is a construction of the mind, Mm. a construction that is, again, malleable, plural and mutable and this is the part of contemporary magic philosophy that i can't completely get behind right. because i think this is because of how deeply i have integrated the scientific mindset mm-hmm. of trying to find ways to bypass bias and self-delusion in order to get closer to the truth the external truth as i do believe that reality exists outside of me in some way <laughs> it seems to me that there is a there is a reality that requires no audience in order to exist, a reality outside of our own psychocosm or our own reality tunnel. Yet magic suggests that all reality is, is what you have conformed it to be. So this is why I often look at contemporary magicians as people who have not stripped away illusion, but who are just expertly self-deluded. People who are driven (laughs) by their will as opposed to being driven by the desire for truth. So a question that I want to ask you is, you know, it may seem great to cause reality to change in conformity with your will, Mm -hmm. but when do we need to conform ourselves to reality? Sure. I think, um, so I I guess I want to distinguish this idea of the will um, with that of the true will, which is, Mm. you know, something that, that Crowley harped on for a while was, you know, do what thou wilt or you know, changing reality and conformity with will isn't about just doing what you want or, or creating some uh, outcome that you'd prefer. Getting all your hedonistic pleasures. That, well, that's this kind of that's the kind of Satanist turn on it mm. is the idea. It's like do what thou wilt, not thy will be done. You know, like from the Lord's Prayer that you should kind of surrender to some higher deity. It's like, no, I am God, an aspect of myself is connected to the all and therefore i can you know go about my life doing the things that i want but Mm -hmm. really you know what crowley really um is subtle about is this idea of the true will which is connected to something beyond you so um or something deep within you sure you know yes like mean going back to the idea of beyond the ego beyond the ego something that may be deeply programmed into you um, that is not necessarily uh, that doesn't bubble up into conscious awareness, right. but that your con- that you can something that you can use your conscious awareness uh, as like a programmer to mm. to uh, cause change to those deeper parts of yourself to essentially use your consciousness to use your ego as mm. the programmer of yourself. Yeah, you know. So the deep parts, if you want to talk about all of this very scientifically and psychologically, you can. This is what why it's useful to mm-hmm. leverage some of the metaphors that, that people like Robert Anton Wilson has popularized, this idea of a reality tunnel. Mm-hmm. It's like, is that a synchronicity or is that a coincidence? Mm. Is that a coincidence or is that good timing? But so reality tunnel, like I, I love that idea because, of course, so much of reality is, you know, due to our perspective we don't no. see the world as it is we see the world as we are right. you know and your mood can completely color mm. uh the way you perceive the world yeah. and then these in a postmodern vein uh contemporary magicians will say that there is no external world there is no truth mm. it's just a construction of your own mind and mm. we're just kind of it seems like they're suggesting we should just backpedal into a, a solipsism mm-hmm. where think... we are where everyone else is just a supporting character and but the way i look at mm-hmm. it i love um scott adams uh the creator of the dilbert comics um mm-hmm. he wrote a really amazing book called god's debris and one of the ways that he describes uh human experience uh he called it um 
uh, bees on stained glass, mm -hmm. where there's this there's this sacred temple with this light inside of it that represents true reality, reality outside of the subjective experience. And then there are stained glass windows on the outside of the temple. And we, being individuals, mm. are just bees sitting on a fragment of stained glass yeah. looking through at this light yeah. where you know, your piece of stained glass that you're sitting on might be red, right. mine might be green. Uh, Oblong uh, shape uh, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, exactly, yeah. different shapes. So there are just colors different a, a lenses mm -hmm. uh, and the bee might be able to have some control over how that lens is, uh, how that glass is colored or shaped. Yeah. So that there's that, but there is that external truth that is that exists on the other side of our subjective yeah. experience. So uh, what do you think of that? And how do you think that um, contemporary magicians uh, kind of look at this idea of external truth? So I think the external truth would be the true will, right? So mm -hmm. it's not yeah. something that's deeply programmed or embedded within you. The true will is that aspect that's actually true. Mm -hmm. It's what remains when everything is gone. Maybe we can call it that immortal aspect mm -hmm. of you. And, and th there's a lot of different models that, that magicians use to describe reality, quote. Um, I think Rushkoff might have been quoting someone or he mentioned this, but he said reality or nature is that thing that if you ignore it, it kills you. Yeah. So solipsism isn't really, yeah, <laughs> ultimately, where is that going to take you? All this is happening in my head. It's like, you know, where, how far are you going to really get there? I think that, yeah. so, so there's this idea of the true will as being part of your mission here, your purpose mm. for being. And I think we get into a lot of kind of philosophical hot water with thinking about reality as having a telos, as having an end or meaning or purpose, right? So, you know, folks, especially in, in the, the 21st century sectarian model, you know, materialist model of the world, we kind of fall into nihilism mm -hmm. and consumerism as a way to express those aspects of ourselves. And um, I think that using the tree of life as a model for components of our soul. The a Kabbalistic tree of life? Yeah, the Kabbalistic tree of life as a kind of visual diagram for different qualities and aspects of well, really of God, right? Or of mm -hmm. Godhead um, and how that kind of uh, f breaks, fractalizes through the different qualities as it makes its way down into the denser material mm -hmm. realm. And if you move up into what's called the supernals, there's this higher aspect of you, maybe even this eternal component of you. Mm -hmm. Maybe consciousness precedes matter. Maybe mm -hmm. consciousness is a prerequisite for matter to come into form, mm -hmm. you know, um, in the beginning was the word and the word mm. was God and the word was with God and this idea of the logos. And yeah, I, I love that because, and I think you just touched on something that I want to get into next is, um, so magic being this thing that you can, uh, utilize to step more into alignment with your true will. Mm. And you just mentioned in the beginning was the word and the word was God. Something that Terrence McKenna said was that reality is made of language. Mm. And if you know the right words, you can make of it anything you want. Mm. And that gets into how I uh, kind of understand magic or how I use magic as a map of understanding reality, where mm. for me, magic is not uh, like voodoo or Santeria or, um, you know, uh, little rituals where you want someone to stop talking so much so you write their name on a piece of paper and put it in a cup and freeze it mm, you know something that, that's something like i've heard okay. uh, recently you don't like, think those work i don't think those work mm, i you haven't done them <laughs> <laughs> well i guess i don't know maybe i'm afraid to experiment, experiment. but i think that uh, there's going no back to what i was saying go i think that uh i think that magic for me is the use of language and the use of symbolism to uh, to interact and interface with uh, reality? Reality being the like, filters. The, what you described the as filters. The filters. So if there's yeah. this true light, yeah. uh -huh. the source of light. Then all you're ever playing with is the kind of knobs and levers of perception. And that is language. You know, like yeah. language Media. is the way in which you. Uh, 
you program and, and, and twist those knobs mm. around. Neuro linguistic you... programming. Yeah, exactly. Those are all different components of yeah. psychology and mm -hmm. its embeddedness in the nervous system. Yeah. Um, but then there's even subtler energetic components that you know you get into through yoga, meditation, mm -hmm. um, maybe even into very kind of speculative new but age I'm ideas, in getting astral, into, into whatever. This idea of um, symbols being utilized uh, as a magical practice because mm. um, you know. Know, we could talk about sigils, yeah. uh, which is a, a magical practice where you, uh, how again, do you create a sigil? Sure. So, I mean, okay. So Grant Morrison kind of popularized this idea that cor corporations or corporate logos mm -hmm. are really just sigils. Yes. And it is this idea of using symbol, using... Well, sigils specifically, you take a sentence uh, that, uh, like an intention, yeah. and you take out, is it every word, that every letter that isn't a vowel? You take and out every vowel. every repeat. You take out every vowel. And every repeat You take consonant. out every repeat, and then you layer all those letters on top of each other. Or you turn and, them into a little drawing, so and, you don't and, have to put them all on And top then of it creates an image symbol, that is yeah. char a symbol that is charged with that with, intention. With that intention and that is something that is really interesting and also you mentioned how uh corporations could use logos yeah. as sigil, sigil magic yeah. uh, uh using a symbol to cause change in conformity with will corporations sure. are creating sigils to, to manipulate cause the reality that will like, let people buy will will incentivize people to <laughs> buy their product or coerce because you know? the coerce the, persuade because the, you know? the nefarious aspect of sigil magic, because the cool thing is you could do it on yourself, mm. right? So the McDonald's arch mm -hmm. is something that I, I, I believe Rushkoff said that between the ages of 18 and 24 months is when they're really trying to get mm -hmm. that arch in front of you. That's why there's the playhouse in the back. Yeah. It's so that you're bringing these kids to have a more tactile. Now they're not. Now Do you know not. that now that uh, a lot of the McDonald's that had those playhouses yeah, yeah. are um, now being revamped to be these like modern McDonald's. The McDonald's in sure. my hometown, small town well, in the suburbs. Uh, Flat uh, screens. Philly in Morrisville, the McDonald's has a fireplace inside of it, and that's because the people I know, right? The that's because the people who are playing there between eighteen and twenty four months are now adults. They've been programmed, yeah. and how do you get more kids to come there? You get the adults to bring their, their kids, kids there. Yeah. So now, so and then it perpetuates. So yeah. the McDonald's arch is a good example of. Um, uh, symbolism being mm -hmm. used to persuade and coerce, and, and that dynamic anchor. can be understood as magic. Yeah, it's yeah. to anchor an, an association of ideas mm -hmm. into a symbol, which is a sigil. And you know that a doesn't meme necessarily plex. always have to be nefarious because no. the graphic. I thought a lot about this when I was me and Alexa were creating the graphic for this podcast, yeah. um, because the graphic for this podcast, the logo for this podcast. Is a sigil. Yeah, it's an image that I wanted to uh, represent uh, the breadth of my interest to represent to as best as I could through image what occupies the content of my mind. Mm. You know, mm. and that is a sigil, and I I want the the logo to become something that like people think a certain thing when they see that, mm. like when they see that image, they, sure. they understand what the vibe all is. art is that, in that um, way. all art. See, and and that... that's not, I don't it... think that's evil, but I think that when, when does it become, <laughs> when does it become propaganda? Well, program or question. be programmed, right? So yeah. you program the design elements, right? To reflect a particular sensibility yeah. and a series of emotions and ideas. Uh, you've got the city and, you know, technology and molecules and icebergs and stuff. Yeah, we're looking at it right now and flowers and hearts and all those are really kind of archetypal symbols, right? Um, we can start We can start to think of where memes are housed are mm. in archetypes. And yeah. often they're, in, in, they're most useful. I won't even call them nefarious just so mm -hmm. we don't get into a value add or yeah, value judgment value world um, in wounded archetypes or mm -hmm. in repressed archetypes. That's why the the memes that go viral in culture are often about repressed Could components. Could you unpack of, the word meme? Because that's another sure. word where yeah. people hear meme yes. and they think of funny image that yeah. they saw on the internet. A meme is not that. A meme is something that came from Richard Dawkins yes. who uh, created the term to, to, to describe how ideas are transmuted between 
uh, different uh, social animals. Exactly. Uh, and, and so could you could you go into sure. how what a meme is and how it yeah. relates to magic? Yeah, so 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 Richard Dawkins popularized this, I think, in the late '80s, mm. uh, when with he talked the selfish about gene. with the selfish gene, when where he talked about kind of the gene as the smallest unit of uh, replicable ge- uh, de- genetic material, uh-huh. um, and he likened it to, and I guess he made up this word, the meme, mm-hmm. which sounds like a gene, and uh, it's the idea. The idea is that it's, it's the smallest unit of an idea, mm-hmm. right? And so you can actually think of culture as being this world of mimetic complexes and you can think of the 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 waves of mm-hmm. culture and the way this basically Doug Rushkoff calls it the standing wave of culture that mm-hmm. if you're if you align these particular hidden agendas in popular culture to reflect in a meme, whether mm-hmm. that's, I mean, he uses a lot of very uh, classical examples like the Rodney King video mm-hmm. was one of the first real memes to go viral mm-hmm. and it turned into protests in the streets, riots in the streets. Why? Because it expressed through media first as the kind of transmitter of this of this video, um, the fact that black people are being beat up by police and this mm-hmm. is just not being addressed on daytime television Mm -hmm. and and, and nightly news. It's Mm -hmm. like, how are you going to get these ideas out there? Now we live in a world where, you know, the alt-right has access to this mimetic warfare Mm -hmm. as much as maybe a well-meaning progressive person, but it's always going to be a bit manipulative. Well, people on all sides of the political spectrum use symbolism to uh, inject because uh, inject ideology into um into society and something yeah. that uh I wanted to talk about and I think that this will give the audience the best understanding of how we're thinking about memes mm-hmm. is the swastika mm-hmm. the swastika was a meme yes. and and think about when you see that now like it, it's the most powerful symbol for hatred mm. and like kind of this vulgar um deadly ideology Mm -hmm. that we are now repelling ourselves so much from the hammer and sickle if you're more educated on what happened in the soviet union Mm. the hammer the hammer and sickle would be uh the the equivalent to the swastika on the left side of the political spectrum Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. what happened in the soviet union was the far left totalitarianism but something I, i think that the swastika is a really good example and a good way to talk about um it because Especially, I know we've both read a book by Douglas Rushkoff called Alistair and Adolf, yes. where he compares and contrasts Alistair Crowley. Um, how would you describe Alistair Crowley? Uh, 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 the first uh, contemporary magician? He's, um, he's, yeah, he's someone because he's, he, he passed away in the 50s, I believe. Yeah. Um, that, but he's someone who actually grew up, basically in, initiated into secret societies, yeah. super smart, very yeah. wealthy, and learned all these techniques and just wrote a ton. Mm. So today, the kind of syncretic mashup of the Western esoteric tradition, mm-hmm. Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry. Um, Theosophy? Um, not so much. That's Madame Blavatsky oh. and Rudolf Steiner and those those folks. Um, but but he was reflecting on that mm-hmm. material as well. Yeah. Um, but it's what has come to us as kind of the latest iteration of modern magic. Yeah. And yeah. So so yeah, Alistair Crowley uh, was kind of in that vein. But Douglas Rushkoff did a great job contrasting uh, Crowley's ideas with Nazism yeah. and the way that the the swastika was used mm. to um. At, as a, a powerful symbol well, form that, of black that, magic yeah black magic that being charged it, it by conditioned death? an entire country mm. and it, even in a way that was like growing like like a cancer yeah. over humanity yeah. and like something i was thinking about when I, I was thinking about um just the swastika being a meme and yeah. being this symbol that uh, was used in almost every religious tradition has some kind of swastika. history of the swastika. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, it's a positive. It, it's a positive symbol. symbol for peace. But it was in Nazi Germany. Yeah. Like I was thinking, how oh he wi- was a wi- avid women, occultist. I think I feel like women in Nazi Germany, when they saw a man like with a swastika on their arm, they were thinking, "Wow, that's sexy." That's a patriot. You know, that, that's a. But there was an everyone ar- thought. They were doing the right they thing. They all thought they were doing the right thing. That's that, the fucked up that's, part about that's sigils. That's the fucked up part about sigils. That's the fucked up part was, about what corporations it, it, are like doing to us too. It was used 
as a brainwashing technique. It bypasses your prefrontal cortex to attack basically the reptilian fight or flight. Um, Which could be understood as the or subconscious. Be and yeah. that's what we're talking about. It's hitting that brainstem, hitting directly. So really to, the- to, to the point where uh, people thought that someone rocking a swastika was seen as more attractive. You know, Can you imagine and, that? That's so wild to think about yeah. how powerful that image could be. And right. even now... Like when you see like swastikas or, or you hear news stories like about, oh, um, these kids walked, went around and spray painted swastikas <laughs> on the side of this church or, or did so and so at a Jewish cemetery. And it's like, damn, like that, that, okay, it's, it's a collection of lines, mm-hmm. a, a, a collection of right angles. Yeah. But how did that just simple design become such a powerful meme? Yeah. To, to that represent well, it was charged such... with the death of thousands, countless thousands of millions. Yeah, countless six, millions. six million Jews died during uh, during Hitler's reign. Yeah, you know, yeah. and and who knows? I mean, and it's it's. I mean, in that concentrated time period, I, I want to kind of highlight the positive aspect of it too. Yeah, just, I know, just because we we could I, go down this, but, I, I but like, continue talking yeah, about sure. that component. Mm-hmm. The first thing is what you're doing is bypassing the prefrontal cortex. It's why you're taking an intention and taking out all the letters is you want to trick yourself because the the rational mind is going to come up with a million different reasons why that thing couldn't manifest mm-hmm. right and so when you take the prefrontal the inner critic the ego the chattering mind the kind of uh, loose um ungrounded the monkey the monkey um when you take that out of the equation and you send symbols that's the language of the subconscious mind mm-hmm. and it's so much more powerful because very few of the decisions that you're making in your day and the kinds of interactions that you're having are fueled by conscious will decisions they're often deeply motivated by emotional mm-hmm. and psychological aspects of the uh, of the unconscious or subconscious yeah. right lifting the iceberg yeah. so imagine corporation so so what that comic book what that graphic novel is about is about how in a way alistair and adolf by Al- douglas rushkoff alistair and adolf by douglas rushkoff is in a way we lost the propaganda war we might have you know gotten rid of hitler and you know we generally decided as as a culture that these are terrible ideas mm-hmm. that should that shouldn't be repeated um but what we inherited in the West is sigil magic as propaganda. Mm-hmm. That's essentially what the fascists were doing by creating these symbols and these larger than life images. Mm-hmm. It, what you're doing is you're programming your media environment mm-hmm. to create a sense of, of, of the norm of things, right? Mm-hmm. So you're the leader, um, you're the person with power and images and branding and, and symbols make it seem as if, that's nature. Oh, yeah. this is the way it all it's always been, right? Look at the guy's picture in the top of the town square. Like, oh, that it's guy has a MacBook. He's got that little half bitten that little bitten into apple on his laptop. Must be oh, he, he must be creative. Must be creative. <laughs> he must be one of the wild ones. Who yeah. that that, that uh, yeah. commercial back in the nineties? He whatever. must think different. He must think different. Um, which is which is an incredible or way. She. Or she. <laughs> and and so when you think about when you think about memes, ultimately you're thinking about a component of reality so imagine you have all of these different beings inside of you right we know tyler Berger, but who's tyler when he's really hungry mm-hmm. or who's tyler after you know two weeks of dieta and self-introspection it's almost like where's all this information coming from you're like opening whole new portals of information heart opening cacao ceremonies it's like now that my heart is open i have more compassion for this person or mm. i have more compassion for myself how can I? so how are these ideas more like living things mm-hmm. right and we can think of the the world of spirit as the world of ideas or the astral plane so in the digital age where our logos where this kind of propaganda war has migrated is into the social media reality that into we all memes. live in into these forms of memes like mm-hmm. i mentioned you know the rodney king tape was before social mm-hmm. media as we might think of it um but really it's this idea of language as a virus something mm-hmm. that's seeking to replicate itself and it often has more to do with the waves of culture than it has to do with the actual content of the meme mm-hmm. so doug talks about this as like the protein shell around 
around the virus, but that the virus also has to relate where with where we are in culture. Mm. And then it has to, you kind of have to let it go. It's going to, mm. you know, that's what basically the Trump folks figured out is you can create all this outrage and chaos by pointing out some of the kind of hidden agendas in popular culture, the repressed anger, a lot of the tensions that we haven't dealt with, like racism and slavery and um sexism and all, all of these aspects of the co of the collective unconscious that aren't being dealt with you mm. can actually trigger energy you can get energy releases from folks engaging with that kind of propaganda mm -hmm. and so pepe became a big component mm -hmm. of the of the trump war the, this idea of meme magic or mimetic magic mm. translating symbols into political action yeah. and so what you're really playing with is reality so it's not that the memes need to be true they just need to provoke a response so mm. all of these images that of, catalyzes a wave that's already happening and changes reality so if you mm. start showing images of hillary clinton coughing up alien eggs into mm. a, a glass of water mm. um or you know put her next to some reptilian overlord mm. all it's that's going to get a reaction rather mm. than, you know, maybe showing like the financials of the, of the Clinton Foundation. It's like that's much harder to spread as a meme. Mm. So it's like something Doug said was like, let's say there's some area ravaged by by um, uh, floods. You're not going to use mimetic warfare to get people to have to to, to make better decisions for mutual aid. Yeah. It's more of this coercive nudge, nudge. It, it's, 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 it's more unconscious part. Yeah, it it, it's how you're going to drive responses in an almost automatic mm. way. It's not the prefrontal cortex. It's that reptile. Well, That's where it, is, it works. It is being used. Um, I mean, we're bringing up a lot of political examples, uh, specifically with Pepe the Frog on the alt-right, but something that happened in the media recently is the MAGA hat kid, you yeah, know? And I yeah. think that that was used in a similar way by the left, where mm. it was kind of superficially covered to support a political narrative. Um, and a lot of the reporting that had been done on that video has been retracted by a lot of the mainstream media outlets that, because I think that it was very politicized by people on the left mm. to kind of use Donald Trump's uh you fight fire with fire so mm. to speak there's but. a lot of different man there's so many different components to it i mean it has at first it's saying something about um video journalism mm. or even photojournalism like we, we see photos that's a frame so out of context we don't mm. know what happened hours before that photo or video we don't know what happened hours after that video and how it's being covered often has more to do with our digital um economy than yeah. it has to do with maybe even the actual cultural response. Something that Marshall McLuhan said yeah. was the media, the medium is the message, right? you right. know? And, the, right. And, and, and the, basically the parameters, the frame around a particular piece of content is more mm -hmm. how that media, how that content is being transmitted is more important than the content itself, mm -hmm. you know, um, says two people speaking into a microphone, yeah. <laughs> um, to, you know, millions of listeners. <laughs> um, but it, what happened there is our algorithms actually are biased towards this kind of sensationalism. Mm. So what what we have is a media industry contending with citizen journalism, the means of production in the hands of the of the populace at well, large. Because now the the populace at large is the thing that governs the ideas that are spread. Now, it's not just a, po a country of people watching what's on the television. Right. You know, now... Controlled by four now corporations. Now we are adding... Yeah, exactly. Now we are adding to the programming, mm -hmm. and that proliferates bottom-up bottom mimetic transfer. And the social media environments that we're in, this idea of computational propaganda, is that algorithms today are like the demons of yesteryear, right? Mm -hmm. So our algorithms, the same way that memes are attacking the reptilian brain, so are our algorithms in uh, prodding us and probing us to act more automatic uh, with less thought with mm -hmm. less conscious decision why because these platforms are monetized by clicks and likes mm -hmm. and viewing time and engagement and retweets and sharing so it doesn't matter that we're ruining the the, the fabric of democracy by spreading sensationalist memes about how hillary clinton is an alien what matters <laughs> is that there are more clicks and there are more people making money and that was part of the i guess my push back a little bit about your ideas around mm -hmm. capitalism and honestly this is i really didn't develop 
a, no a nuanced perspective on capitalism until beginning my master's in media studies program mm -hmm. with with Doug Rushkoff. Um, but by nuanced, I mean informed. You know, for mm -hmm. instance, you talked about the kind of paradox of tearing down the rainforest, which is the home of m medicines that You're have talking about my what I said on my last podcast with Edgar Soto. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, that you know, you talked a little bit about uh, you know rainforest being torn down so that we can create uh, pasture ranges for cows to make burgers you know mm -hmm. and and that's capitalism that's yeah. the meme the ideology yeah. of capitalism that and, and it's also capitalism today we're dealing with a kind of different monster we're dealing with capitalism on on digital steroids mm -hmm. so we've actually all of these corporations who had to contend with human beings in the real world now are on an evil playing ground when we move into the astral plane of cyberspace mm -hmm. because now we're symbols online we're our avatar yeah. and so the corporations also were un are we're ungrounded and untethered to other human beings we're mm -hmm. often engaging with these things individually it mm -hmm. could take you into a narcissistic paranoid uh world of delusion about mm -hmm. uh, the Illuminati and the black helicopters and all these different things in, in the age of fake news, we're being more and more isolated. And this is how this stuff works on us. So now what, what we have is corporations on automatic and their business plans are nudging us and prodding us to engage with them in very particular ways that are more and more mm -hmm. automatic and less conscious. Yes. And I think that transitions perfectly into uh, kind of, well, I guess going back to why I wanted to think more pessimistically about all this, or rather critically uh, mm. might be a better word. But so when I started going to college, my freshman and sophomore year, I was a business major and I wanted to go into advertising. Mm. Uh, I really loved writing and I wanted to be a screenplay writer and a novelist. And I thought that the best way to do that would be to go into advertising and be a copyright for uh, television advertisements. Mm. And then I could kind of go from that as a profession to the more artistic creative and kind of pivot into writing uh, copy for like shows. Um, jingles, maybe a little jingle. <laughs> Hot I, pocket. I don't, I don't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. I, I wanted to create uh, espresso shots of media that influenced people. Mm. And I thought it was a, a good uh business model i sure. thought okay i could advertise a product even if the product fails fails i've yeah. done my job mm. um so i i thought like oh cool advert and i also i feel like i always had a good intuition for how companies were trying to manipulate uh the masses yeah. something that i remember uh just having a strong reaction to was when i was in middle school uh the most popular clothing brand was hollister uh and abercrombie and fitch right and i remember like seeing all these people buy hollister clothing and all of the shirts had hollister written on the front yeah. and my thought was why are these people paying money to be essentially billboards for this company. Why would you pay money to wear a company's logo? Merchants uh, of Cool. Merchants of Cool is a great documentary by Douglas right. Rushkoff. So now that's look cool. That. So, so you become a living meme. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for uh, this symbol, this uh, little bird. Until the CEO of Hollister, I, I, I believe, uh, Hollister or Abercrombie said that um, he doesn't want fat people to wear his clothes. The, so they never they, go above so, medium. So, yeah, they never. Medium. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they. Uh, so there was this movement against that called um uh hollister the homeless where people were going around <laughs> giving this. hollister clothing to homeless people yeah. so now like hundreds of homeless people in new york are city are, are, we <laughs> are wearing the hollister logo and that has an effect on the meme of that logo yeah. but i just remember thinking it was so weird that someone would rock a logo that they don't even really have a connection with mm. uh, just this corporation right. that is just kind of helping them think that they're cool so they will get caught in a feedback Gucci, loop prada uh, yeah getting Benz, these name brands of all these Lambo. products that woo, have woo the name of the company on them and i just i remember like thinking and being captivated by why would someone pay to be a billboard and but i didn't think about it as morally as i did until 
mm. about a year and a half mm. uh, into my college career, I just realized I was on the wrong side of the coin. Sure. I was on, I was on the wrong side of things. Mm. This is being use advertising is manipulation yes and manipulation in a way that seems to be me immoral yeah so i completely pivoted my entire academic career cool. and went into psychology when i became disillusioned which makes you a better marketer actually <laughs> oh great well i'm not on that path anymore i, I hope to I mean, contribute it, uh positively well you that's know? the thing it's kind of like when you mentioned tony robbins in your last podcast about not really trusting these guys Mm -hmm. I, I don't blame you. You know, that this is the thing about pop pop spirituality mm -hmm. and self-improvement. What you were thinking about as a young person going, you know, I, I'll go into marketing, you know, it's because you're paying for a college degree. So you mm -hmm. have to think about how are you, I mean, what you were really thinking about is how can I be an artist? I want to be mm -hmm. a novelist and a screenplay. And, and this, also pay for my degree. But, you know, it'll help me with communications and it'll help me express myself more creatively. So maybe I can create value in the world of business and marketing because those guys are mm -hmm. creative right where do you think yeah. all these ideas about going into a creative field even came from as a young person you have no idea and i mean look we, we we take in as much as we can as younger people but even by the time we graduate college we really have no idea about political economy and about the, the the conglomeration of corporations and the messages that are being controlled and the wars that are being propagandized and the slave labor and child labor. I mean, there's all these things that make the world tick as it is today. And we take it for granted as, oh, of course, we live in a world where money is debt and debt needs to grow to be paid back. So we're going to have, in, you know, corporations like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram grow into these behemoths until they become reality until mm -hmm. we're going into mcdonald's as a public space even though it's a private corporation yeah bring your kids come to the library here we got a fireplace we'll keep them nice and warm for you it's like you're going to mcdonald's for that that's rough right <laughs> yeah. and so that was something grant morrison pointed out in his disinfo talk about sigils is you know if if we keep letting corporations operate this way we're all going to be living in fucking mcdonald's mm -hmm. is how he said it in a very we're being programmed Scottish and rather accent. than programming so even the, the economic assumptions that you made about like hey maybe i can be a creative but then i can also make my mom and dad proud that i got a degree <laughs> by making a little bit of money in marketing and i'll just use that money to do like really good art and mm -hmm. positive stuff and it's like wow that's how much it's in the air we breathe. Yeah. It's like, well, what, what is And this? I wasn't thinking at all about how I would have become a cog in this machine, this subverted machine. I mean, we're cogs in that, so many that, different that machines programs. right now. <laughs> I mean, uh, advertising really does, again, bypass the conscious mind. That's what it's Advertisers for. are not advertising to you. They're advertising to your brain, you know? Uh, Neuromarketing is a very popular Neuromarketing, thing. yeah. Did I turn my mic off? You're good. Neuromarketing is a very popular thing, but it's a way to sell marketing techniques to other marketers. So mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, we threw neuro, neuro in there. Now it's new. So now, now you can buy our book and, and now you can science. know something else. Oh, you know, because we can tie oh. uh, purchase. We could tie basically content, uh, con consuming content with a particular purchasing behavior. And the mm -hmm. better the data gets between that, it's why a lot of um, this idea of like, uh, of of just going into a digital currency mm -hmm. it's so that there's better data on what mm -hmm. people are spending their money on so that when companies are sharing that data with other corporations mm -hmm. you can see these are his buying habits along with the content that he's consuming along with the mm -hmm. websites he spends the most time on target him this way yeah. that way target her this way that way uh you know red they respond to red text they click on red text get mm -hmm. him that way in the top left side of the screen and it's always changing we're in this kind of weird labyrinth of our own a reflection of our own self through how these algorithms perceive us to be. Mm -hmm. and, and we just... and often they are incredibly accurate. You know, behavioral Somewhat, economics yeah. is something that well, I... They're incredibly accurate because they're incredibly effective manipulative uh, yeah. techniques. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. But something that I thought was really interesting uh, when I learned this. Uh, so in department stores, it's a little bit different in malls. Yeah. Uh, but so malls, the uh, entrance closest to the mall is often the perfume section yeah. because the aroma smelling that... Mm. Uh, Will, will pull you into the store. But also something that is really interesting, and this is hilarious about human behavior, um, often when you go through the front door of a department store, it's one of two sections. It's the child children section, children clothing section, or it's men. Uh, because think about the people who don't want to spend much time shopping and looking for what they need. Men 
and women or men with children. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be out long with kids. Uh, So it needs to be close to the doors. It needs to be easy to find. And my business teacher who I had, he said, women, like you could hide things in the store and they'll find it. You know, women tend to have a higher predisposition to shopping. (laughs) And also it's funny in malls, like you go, they have those like circles of chairs in the middle of the lobbies between stores. And it's just like a bunch of husbands, like a bunch of dads just like there. sitting there on the yeah me too uh, on your just cell sitting phone, on just... your cell phone waiting Wait. for your partner yeah. to uh finish their shopping so i, I think it's interesting that yeah. uh department stores found out that uh i guess stereotype or generalization of of human nature where they're like okay we're gonna completely orient our stores around the behaviors that we've discovered oh, the behavioral yeah. differences those are highly people. programmed environments yeah I mean, highly programmed th- so you you definitely have to read a this supermarket book coercion Co- what's it called it's called coercion by by doug rushkoff and he talks exactly mm. about the basically the the design the experience mm. design of malls and like basically the way that it's designed is to untether you from mm. the parking lot so you yeah. walk in and you anchor yourself to one of these department stores sears jc penney's mm-hmm. macy's and, and they're all towards the exits yeah. so that once you're anchored in the mall the idea of leaving becomes even harder and mm-hmm. then once you start walking in these ways that basically you can't ever find your way in a direct path yeah, and you start spinning around until you it's don't a good even infinity know. Infinity symbol. Yeah, you don't even know where you are, so you're lost. So guess what? You're gonna see more stores, mm-hmm. and now that you're all discombobulated from having walked around, and you don't even know which which direction your car is in, you're spending more time at these stores that have on ramps that are yeah. really well lit, and it's so easy but to just glide you into know that well perfumed. Yeah, you know what's scary now is um, I recently went back to my hometown and I went to the Oxford Valley Mall, which was the hip spot to be when you were 13 and yeah. old enough to hang out without your home. parents. Yeah. You're like, yeah, I'm hanging out. I'm a big kid now. You know, I'm 13. I'm a teenager. So it was like the hip spot to hang out. And mm. it was always crowded on Friday and Saturday nights. The Oxford Valley Mall was always packed. Now, and I've talked to other people who still live in my hometown who wasteland. have experienced that. It's a wasteland. The mall is becoming empty oh, yeah. because the shopping mall dynamic is moving online. It's digitized. So now all these dynamics that existed for the success, the manipulative done. success of the shopping mall, done. it's moving on to the digital environment. It's already done. All these yeah, malls are, no one's there. And all these malls are so sad to it's, go to these malls yeah, because it it's just like a relic. It's weird how fast we're moving through things because if the mall seems like a relic, geez, man, I, yeah. I feel bad for grandparents who have to navigate this uh, this reality today. But you yeah. go there and it's just like, ugh. Yeah. Just w- the way that you see people being advertised mm-hmm. to it's so obvious mm-hmm. and it's even worse because it's gross it's like clickbait it's, it's like clickbaity it's the advertising worst kind of yeah. fake nonsense and you go like oh so so doug talks about this idea of like margaret mead and gregory bateson basically concocting this concept of of Americans living in a world of screens and that Mm. these screens give us the sense of an illusion of choice. Mm. So it becomes a kind of democratic ideal. Like I have choice. I'm free. We get to vote. We get to choose between Mm -hmm. different laundry detergents, but it's really the same one or two different corporations Mm -hmm. under different brand names. Right. So it's like you go to the mall and you get to choose between Hollister and Abercrombie. And I think they're the same thing, really. I mean, one has a bird and the other one has a moose. It's like, (laughs) all right, they're both, you know, really overpriced. I go to American Eagle, bro. Highly, it's an eagle. yeah. And there's these it's logos. America. It just makes me so sad. Um, and the food is just terrible. Mm. You're not gonna find anything that you should be consuming. And I'm like, why do we live in a reality legitimately programmed to push people in directions that are outside of their own best interests? We mm-hmm. live in a world of demons that basically are because our best interests aren't often very profitable to the people who stand to profit off of selling something. In order to buy something thing we need to feel like we lack that thing so advertisers are convincing us that we have problems we don't have so we buy things that we don't actually need that's kind of what i to impress people we don't really care or like and that's really what changed my my tune about advertising it's 
like, oh, if I go into advertising, I'm going to be an expert at convincing people that they are lacking something, that they are in a state of scarcity, and, and that, uh, that often, I offer the solution. You're often convincing 10-year-olds to buy yeah. Axe who are prepubescent and don't yeah. even need deodorant yet. Yeah. But it's like, no, spray all this aluminum into directly into your pores, into your what are the lymphs under your uh -huh. armpits, and it's like, and you're going to be great. It's like, why couldn't we use the same nefarious, awful and conditioning to dude, do things Axe that make commercials, people live longer? Axe commercials are hilarious. Oh, they're on the nose. They know it's cell sex, period. It's so all sex. It is. Dude, you put on Axe, and all of a sudden, you're girls being are ripping chased your clothes by a, a mob of models you know it's so <laughs> ridiculous it's a me it's a character it's, so it's a caricature of itself everything is satire it is a parody of that's itself. why trump works today yeah because he's gonna be like yeah i said this other week and i'm saying this this week all right whatever do something about it it's like mm -hmm. well, at least he's honest about lying and we just leave it at that it's yeah. like no you know what are, what are we doing and and this is you know one of the big things about rushkoff's kind of whole team human thing is if you unwind all of this conditioning you take away this economic paradigm which was cooked up in the middle ages or uh you know in the 1300s by proto-monarchs if you if you remove this veil of culture and what it means to be cool or in or hip or mm -hmm. even spiritual mm -hmm. if you remove the veil of what we really need and want often we want positive engagement with our peers with other mm -hmm. human beings we we really care about having love and loving connection mm -hmm. with with human other human beings and we often really just need the very very fundamental things taken care of like food shelter clothing and beyond that very few people that we know are like bro listen it's lamborghini or bust <laughs> and more and more you know if, if you really do that I mean, this kind of goes full circle. That's what the whole magical path has been for me. Mm -hmm. It's really just the Western. It's it, it's the yoga of the West. Mm -hmm. It's the Western path to enlightenment, and and it, and it's relatively suited towards a Western temperament of people who feel that they need to do something to gain enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Although it's all about undoing and mm -hmm. unconditioning mm -hmm. and just being and just sitting and just watching the breath and just uncoupling yourself from this story so magic that, i guess could be understood as a way to uncouple yourself from the manipulation from external sources to try to make you into something that you're not or put layers over yourself program that, or be programmed mm -hmm. and this yeah. is uh, in a weird way it's kind of like it's it's a necessary self-care modality mm -hmm. for the 21st century digitarian you know mm -hmm. it's like we, you're living in chapel perilous you're living in the realm that robert anton wilson described of bubbling confusion and quasi paranormal activity and to ground yourself in a world of basically you know uh, automated add everything is pulling you in all these directions and it's mm -hmm. not humans mm -hmm. it's bots and algorithms and all these things that we've thrown into automatic and they pull us it's so unfortunate that i feel like having a regular conversation with yeah. someone is so much about how we could say hey yeah you know how everyone else is doing this don't do that that's poison hey you know how everyone else is doing this working until they you know the whole body is collapsing no wake up in the morning have some water with lemon juice breathe fresh air mm -hmm. get some sunlight all these little really simple things it's like no wonder we're all nuts. It's like we're so unhinged and ungrounded mm -hmm. that, you know, you find yourself kind of crawling back into the crevices of, you know, um, mindful culture mm -hmm. and being open to indigenous practices. It's like, oh, what did we leave behind? Yeah. What did well, in a way, we are we are trying to cure what something something that Douglas Rushkoff calls present shock. Yeah. Where we are being represented in the digital space across so many different platforms yeah. that it's literally fragmenting our personality and, and causing this this uh, this deep stress where we have and it's all coming at us at the same time the same. you know i there is tyler james Berger on instagram there's tyler james Berger on facebook there is tyler james Berger on uh, youtube or or any other of these or lifting platforms the iceberg. or lifting the iceberg well lifting the iceberg it not 
it, well, lifting the iceberg would be something on the platforms, but I, I don't have a platform myself. You know what I mean? So, but who you are when I go into your WordPress is all it, about the design. It's, it's all self, about, I go yeah. there, there's color patterns and mm -hmm. there's things that are representing who you are. But, and, and that, that I need to insulate myself from. I, I need to not confuse, I guess, the map with the territory, yes. and, so to speak, you know, yes. where you can leverage all these things as tools, exactly. but you can't integrate them into your ego because that will only lead to this phenomenon that Doug Rushkoff calls present shock, yeah. where in the present moment, you are fragmented between mm -hmm. uh, perhaps a dozen represent digital representations of yourself. And, and because of that, so much easier to manipulate. Mm. And unfortunately, I feel like, wow, do we really live in a society where we have to kind of like... We, we have to have people be in alert mode to mm. all these different forms of manipulation. Like you're, you're being attacked. You know, all of your data is being filtered through these artificial intelligence predictive programming algorithms that are predicting yeah. your, your future behaviors based on past behaviors and re yeah. And you know what too, this scary thing is we feel like we're not paying for it. We feel like it's free, it's gonna you change. know, but it's not free. You know, yeah. we think that, Facebook is the product, but we are the product. Mm -hmm. That's why it's free. Our attention is a resource that that corporate magicians are competing for. Mm -hmm. uh, a meme propagates because we give it attention. Yes. It's almost like if a meme was an organism, attention is the water. Yes. Uh, attention is how you water it. It's got a charge. And, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So That's it, why they're paying all those dollars at the Super Bowl halftime mm -hmm. to put these little silly little things around, beam mm -hmm. it directly into your subconscious, yeah. and have you associate it with a bunch of different emotions. Why mm -hmm. is it at halftime? It's often the most exciting part of the game. Mm -hmm. Who's going win it's still anybody's game mm -hmm. oh there's a performance someone's going to be taking you know janet jackson's going to be showing her boobs or whatever you know there's all and she's holding the bud light <laughs> you know yeah it, it's so strange and it, and it's 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 just to kind of embed this a little bit deeper into what this means for me mm -hmm. i think that you know after deep introspection about the condition the human condition and what is good for me? What is right for me? What do I want? I spent a lot of time going inwards and just found that there's really no one there. Mm. You know, I, I kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this here. I kind of did this little mindfulness practice where you basically sit down for 15 minutes and you ask yourself two really simple questions. The first question, and you tr really try to do this as honestly with yourself as possible. And, you, and the first question is to ask yourself, what is it that I am afraid of? And you keep just in like a mantra, repeating that in your in your mind. What is it that I'm afraid of? And try to feel it. So it's, your mind's going to take you a bunch of different places. You know, my parents dying, me dying, not having shelter, my girlfriend not loving me, my puppy being gone, all my little things that are for me terrifying. When I was in this state of just mindful, objective awareness, the next question is, who is it that's afraid? Mm. And I spent some time, who is it that's afraid? And I just looked around and I'm in this really expansive, vast domed void of darkness and bliss. And there's no one there. And I can't find anyone to attach these weird feelings to. And it's because I took a moment to still my mind. Mm. And, I recommend that practice for folks who are really trying to get into That sounds really liberating. Introspection a, a really about, mm -hmm. a great way of liberating yourself yeah. uh and and releasing a layer that you feel uh isn't necessarily uh a, attached to who you are. Yes. And uh, going back to um manipulation through the media through the use of magic yes. like sometimes you uh, I've done that before where I kind of I kind of take a third person perspective mm. to who I am mm. and I go like, okay, what's, what's underneath of all of this? And, and I try to try to chip away these often surface emotions of fear yep. or even the, Anxiety, uh, the illusion of happiness or, or sure. any kind of, or doubt. These or concepts. Yeah. yeah. These concepts uh, and kind of um, using 
like trying to get a, get rid of the layers that the magical practices of others may have placed over us. Yeah. And uh, a story the I really sorcery, like, yeah. the sorcery and a story I really like is um, when Michelangelo was asked how he created a sculpture as perfect as David. Mm. He said, I simply chipped away everything that isn't David. Mm. And I feel like advertising and media and any kind of manipulation that there are that is using these magical practices yeah. to persuade us and coerce us it's adding layers onto our sense of self yeah. that it it yeah. remains our responsibility to continue to uh figure out techniques and ways to release that conditioning yeah. you know and, and become the master of yourself and i yeah. think that that's honestly the takeaway for what your uh idea of magic is or what the contemporary contemporary idea of magic is yeah. is being in the driver's seat of your own <laughs> experience yeah. rather than being a passenger seat that being in the past or being a, a puppet to someone else's goals sure. someone else's intentions yeah. for you yeah. um so i think that magic can be an incredible way of getting to that state place of independence mm -hmm. you know of independent mm -hmm. thought where you can then move forward in your own truth mm -hmm. not a truth that has been manipulated by external forces yeah. you know yeah wow rafael i think i think that's a good place to wrap it up yeah magic I as a way of getting in touch with your internal truth a truth that exists deep inside of you under the iceberg and with that the iceberg has been lifted the iceberg has been lifted Tyler. <laughs> that was great and I'm, yeah. I'm happy we we were able to kick this off and really hone in on i think the themes that you're exploring um mm. but from all different directions we had mm -hmm. media we had i mean psychology marketing self-development spirituality mm -hmm. i mean all these kind of different disparate threads and i think that they kind of find a really neat little home in your sigil mm -hmm. and for lifting the iceberg and i just you know i thank you again for having me on and i wish you many many more blessings on this journey thank you again for listening to the lifting the iceberg podcast you can find rafael zaki on twitter at rafael underscore zaki Thank you to Alexis Spatty for designing the graphics for this podcast. You can find her at alexispatty.com. Thank you to Caruso for the soundtrack Stay With Me. You can find Caruso on Spotify, YouTube, and SoundCloud. You can stay up to date on any new podcasts at liftingtheiceberg.com or by following Lifting the Iceberg on Facebook and Instagram.